record my last American literature class. Such a disaster. OK, last week I did not give you the full poem of a valediction forbidding morning, so that I just passed out. Uh, so now we can look at this poem. Here you go. So the related discussion question was, uh, there were two, right? The first one is, what kind of imagery does this poem use? Uh, the second one was, is John Donne a philosophical, metaphysical poet? Um, and I mentioned the key image is about the compass, Ringue. So look at line 25. If they be two, the they here means we two lovers, you and me. If they be two, they are two, so as stiff twin compasses are two. So the two legs of the compass, Thy soul, the fixed foot, uh, so the, the part of the compass that does not move, is you. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. So it looks like you don't move, but if the other leg moves, then you also move. And though it in the center sit, and when the other far doth roam. So when you stay in the center and the other leg or me uh, goes far away, it leans and hearkens after it. So the leg in the middle will lean outward and follow the other leg and grows erect as that comes home. And as the leg outside comes back to the middle, the leg in the middle will stand back up. Such wilt thou be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. So this is actually you and me. You will, uh, me, who must obliquely run. So if I am the leg who has to go outside to draw the circle, you will be my leg in the middle. Thy firmness makes my circle just. When you are firm and straight, I will be able to draw a perfect circle and makes me end where I begun. And if you stay in the middle, I, you are the reason I can come back home. Isn't that beautiful? So that's the part I didn't uh, talk about last week. Questions? OK, so for this week. Um, you were supposed to read a modest proposal by Jonathan Swift. Uh, and because we're doing the EPT next period. Um, I will lecture about. The discussion questions. Sorry for depriving you. Of the chance to discuss. A modest proposal. OK. OK, so. Kind of small. There we go, OK. Question. Sorry. Hang on. OK, question one. Why do you think the essay sometimes credits ideas to other people? So throughout the essay, we notice that the author says, I learned this from somebody else. Um, let's see.
So for example, page 13 at the bottom. Uh, we talked about this last week. I am assured by our merchants, Sangren, that a young child cannot be sold at a profit. Um, and then on the next page, I have been assured by a very knowing American that a young, healthy child is very delicious. So it seems like a lot of these important ideas, the author pretends to learn from other people. Why? We know it's not true because the whole proposal is a joke. So why does he pretend that he got some of these ideas from other people? Well, we can think about what happens when you say this. If you are writing an essay and you say, oh, I got this idea from this expert. I got this idea from somebody who knows a lot about this. What is the effect on your reader? Perhaps they might trust you more. Because it's not just your idea. You were talking with people who have more knowledge than you. You're using the idea of experts, of people uh, who know what they're talking about. Um, so in an essay that proposes a new idea or a new way to do something, mentioning that it's not just your idea, that you got lots of these parts from experts should make your proposal more persuasive, more convincing. Now, in this case, it's a joke. So when Smith, sorry, Swift, Taylor Swift, Jonathan Swift, they're related. Did you know that? Taylor Swift is a descendant of Jonathan Swift. But when Swift uh, says he gets these ideas from other people, and we know that he's joking, he's he's satirizing, as I feng si, then what he's actually doing is saying that this problem is so serious that everybody agrees uh, about how serious it is. It's saying like all of these people I asked or all of these people I pretended to learn from, we all agree on the same solution. Uh, and in this case, the solution is to eat poor babies. Um, so it's saying like it's not just my problem, it's everybody's problem. Question two, the essay mentions the famous Salmanazar. So uh, you do not pronounce the P, P is a jinging. The famous Salmanazar, a native of the island Formosa. Right? Salmanazar was an imposter. Uh, this is a very interesting story. So um, around this time, a dude appeared in England and said he was from the island of Formosa, which today we call Taiwan. And people believed him. You might think it should be pretty obvious he's not from Taiwan, right? He's a European guy. But you should remember this was not uh, in the 20th century. This was in the 18th century. They did not have TikTok. They didn't, did not even have photographs. If you wanted to see a picture, somebody had to draw or paint the picture. And uh, you know, Formosa is a very small island. It's it was not very important uh, in the international arena at that time. So the guy says he's from Formosa. Could be. He has details about this strange society. He wears strange clothing. He eats different food. So how do we know if he's lying or not? So this guy, Salmanazar, pretended to be from Formosa. He would give like talks and lectures about Formosan culture. He would write about his experiences and sell his books. He became famous and rich until one day some Jesuits, Yesu Hederen, came back from the actual Formosa and said, no, wait, no, this guy's lying. Uh, and then his his life uh, went in a 180 degree direction. So for a time, people believed him. So when in this essay, Swift says the famous Salmanazar, a native of the island Formosa, 
Do you think Swift knew that he was fake? And how can you tell? So let's look at that's a very strange page number. What page is that? Two, four, six, five. Page. Oh, page 15. OK, let's see, where is it? OK, here, but in order to justify my friend, he confessed that this expedient or this very good strategy was put into his head by the famous Salmanazar, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence from there to London about 20 years ago and in conversation told my friend that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, the executioner sold the carcass or the body to persons of quality as a prime dainty or a delicious food. And that in his time, the body of a plump girl of 15, who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor, was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state and other great mandarins or officials of the court in joints from the gibbet at around 400 crowns. So according to this essay, Salmanazar says that Taiwan or Formosa has an emperor, has a prime minister has many great officials has a court and that they are rich enough to buy a young the body of a 15 year old girl for 400 pounds obviously all fake but did swift know there's a footnote you could choose right footnote two let's see what that says george salmanazar a famous imposter a frenchman he imposed himself on English bishops, noblemen, and scientists as a Formosan. He wrote an entirely fictitious account of Formosa in which he described human sacrifices and cannibalism. Right. Cannibalism is Sirenzu. So did Swift know that this guy was a fake? I think the answer is yes, he did know. And that it's part of the joke. I think like when was this published? 1729. When was Salmanazar active? 1679 to 1763. I think at this point people recently discovered that he's a fake. So it's part of the author's joke, right? Look at all of these experts and one of these experts is somebody who's actually the opposite of an expert. Um, and this is one of the few places in the essay where it's very clear that this essay is a joke. Near the end of the essay, the author suddenly gets very serious and becomes very sincere, talking about the real issues of being poor in Ireland. But for most of the essay, it's a big joke. Uh, and sometimes, like in this place, the joke goes so far uh, that, you know, people know it's a joke. There's no longer any doubt. Um, but it fits uh, the idea that the author is putting forward because Salmanazar did say that people in Formosa eat other people. So if the author is pretending to propose eating poor Irish children, it would help to be able to point to somebody else who also says that, you know, we eat people too. So it's a joke that that uh, uses fake history, if you want to put it that way. Uh, if you're interested in the story of this guy, uh, one of my professors in college wrote a whole book about him. Question three. After mentioning some alternatives, the essay says, let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients. So don't tell me about any of these other strategies. Till he has at least some glimpse of hope 
that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them in practice. So don't talk to me about these strategies unless you really believe that people will try to use these strategies. Do you think this sentence is serious or is it also part of the joke? And why? Two, four, six, seven. Uh, page 17. Here. Therefore, I repeat that no man talks to me of these and the like expedients till he had at least some glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them in practice. Okay, so this is the sentence. What are these and the like expedients? What are these other strategies? Uh, here. Therefore, let no man, this is slightly higher on the page. Let no man talk to me of other expedients, other strategies. Of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound. So here he's talking about absentee landlords. Uh, the idea is that a lot of land in Ireland was owned by English people who didn't actually live there. They use their land to collect rent as a way of making money. But because they don't live there, they don't spend money in Ireland. So they end up taking money out of Ireland without giving anything back. And that was one of the key reasons why Ireland was so poor. So here, one of these other strategies is to tax these landlords at five shillings a pound. Every pound may ingbang that they make, they have to pay five shillings. Shilling. Uh, just, it's a smaller kind of currency. Uh, English currency used to be very, very complicated, but shillings are smaller than pounds. Of using neither clothes nor household furniture except what is of our own growth and manufacture. So only using and buying clothes and furniture made in Ireland. Of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury. So refusing and not using or selling anything that is a foreign luxury that makes life better for foreigners or that is that is sold to foreigners for their entertainment. Of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness and gaming in our women. So making sure that Irish women are not so proud, are not so like caring about their beauty, that they don't sit around at home all day, and that they don't gamble all the time. Gaming is to gamble, dubo. Of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance. So a vein of means a little bit of. Parsimony means uh, frugality, jason. So not wasting money. Prudence means wisdom, so using common sense. And temperance, temperance means not drinking so much alcohol. Of learning to love our country. I think that one's pretty clear, right? You should, uh, one of these ideas is to make people love their own country, Ireland. Of Quitting our animosities and factions. So in Chinese we say "不要内斗." Animosity means like uh, anger towards an enemy. Faction is different parts of the same group. So stopping all of this. Of being a little cautious not to sell our country and conscience for nothing. In Chinese, we say uh, Of course, this is exaggeration. You, it, you shouldn't sell your country for anything, not just for nothing. 
of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy toward their tenants. So making sure that landowners have pity and care about the people who live on their land. Lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers. So to make sure our business people and shopkeepers are honest, hardworking, and have good skills. What do you think of these ideas? Do you think these ideas would help Ireland? I think these are serious ideas, right? It would surely be much more help than eating poor children. And yet at the end, the author says, don't, don't talk to me about these ideas unless you can hope that people will actually try these ideas. Question is, is this sentence serious or is this also part of the joke? Um, I asked this question because I think it's kind of both. Like. The the serious part is, you know, all of these good ideas and nobody is doing any of them. That's the serious part. The joke part is if you're not going to do all of these ideas, then we should try eating poor children. It's kind of like. Uh, this is like the the most powerful part of the satire. It's explaining why the author is using this uh, form. I think we're getting into question five. Yes. So why did Swift write a satirical essay instead of a straightforward polemic? And I think the reason is in that part. Because these ideas, all of these ideas that he mentioned were already being talked about. He did not come up with any of these ideas. People knew about these good ideas and nobody was actually doing them. So what use would it be to argue for those ideas? They already knew about these ideas. They already knew it could be helpful, but nobody was doing anything. So instead of trying to convince people, Swift wrote a satire to try to mock people, to reprimand people. Yong Cao Shao Yong If people know what is right, but they don't do it, then talking about what is right doesn't help. You have to make them feel that they should do the right thing. And this is what Swift is, I think, is trying to do with this satire. So that is the effect that he's aiming for. And who were his target readers? Who was he writing for? Was he writing for the poor Irish people? Probably not, right? They're already suffering. They don't have money. They don't have power to change their life. It, it would not mean a lot to write to them. It seems like Swift is writing to English people who own land in Ireland, English people in the parliament who make laws about Ireland, English people who control Ireland. Um, if you, uh, we'll, we'll, we will talk about this in question six, but there's a kind of moral standard by which these English people should care about Ireland, and perhaps they were pretending to care, uh, but it, they were not willing to actually do anything. And so those people were the people that Swift is writing for. Question four, do you think any part of the essay does not make sense aside from the obvious objection? So yes, we should not eat poor Irish children, but what about the other parts of the essay? Are there other parts of the essay that don't make sense? Another way to ask this question is. If we pretend like eating poor Irish children is a good idea. Then is there another 
mistake or error in this essay? Because this essay, first of all, uh, as we mentioned last week, it begins by talking about the problem, explaining how serious the problem is, and then explaining uh, how we can uh, solve the problem by eating poor Irish children. Um, but then it goes on. OK, I'm not going to. It, then it goes on. Since you can eat poor Irish children, they are now a kind of food. So you can grow poor Irish children. And you can grow better ones for rich people and worse ones for poor people to sell to different markets. You can sell them to other countries. You can use them to help feed a more healthy population. Uh, and that's why early in the essay, uh, Swift says that this will not just solve the problem of poor Irish people, it will actually improve the country. Um, and he also says like, um, people naturally want to have children, so there will always be a source of poor Irish children to eat and to sell. The government can pay poor mothers uh, to keep them alive, to get, have more children to sell, Lots of different parts of this big argument. And the thing about these ideas is that they basically all make sense if you agree to eat poor Irish children. That's like the one part of this essay that is completely ridiculous. But everything else makes sense. And that brings us to question six. How can you tell that this was written in the 18th century? Well, uh, I mentioned last week that this essay represents everything important about the 18th century. So, starting from Charles II and then going to James II, the court spent a lot of money and they loved spending money on parties and good food and wine. Where did they get the money? Partly from Ireland. Then you have ideas like the Enlightenment, Qimong Rindong, skepticism, uh, Hua Yilun, the scientific method, the idea that you observe, you think, you propose an idea, you do an experiment, and you observe again. What is this essay doing? It is observing the problem, proposing a solution, and saying, we're not trying anything else. We might as well try this one. It's the scientific method. You have feminism, or a very early kind of feminism. In the essay, when he talks about poor Irish mothers have doing nothing but making new poor babies, that can also be seen as a satire on how uneducated the poor Irish women are. That without a healthy society without good resources and good education. The only thing that they can do to be useful is to have more babies. So in a very indirect way, it is also promoting education and other opportunities for women. Sentimentalism, the idea that humans are all the same, all have the same nature and feelings they just express them differently. So as we just talked about, this essay is trying to prod rich English people to change their actions and laws regarding Ireland. Why would it work? Why don't these rich English bastards just ignore this essay? Because the philosophy at the time was sentimentalism and human nature. Rich people in the upper classes are expected to care about poor people. It's a moral question. So, you know, every time they go out, they have to like give some money away. They have to sort of try to help solve the problems of the people who live on their land. They have to act like they care. But in this essay, very clearly explains why what they're doing is not enough to solve the Irish problem. 
because it is rich English people who created the Irish problem. You can't keep doing what caused the problem and then do some other things to try to pretend like you're solving the problem. It's like Israel saying, oh, we warned you we're going to bomb the hospital, so it's fine. It doesn't work. You shouldn't bomb the hospital. So the essay is using that kind of moral logic to try to get rich English uh, nobles and people to actually change how they behave uh, toward Ireland and Irish people. The essay uses relatively simple language. You don't have like thou and the art and dust. It's relatively simple language that appeals to the emotion of the reader. You're not supposed to agree to eat Irish children. You're supposed to feel horrible that this situation is so bad that somebody would actually say we should eat children. It is a satire. And it is, you can also think of it as a kind of comedy. It's very gothic. Eating people is very gothic. Uh, and then, you know, Ireland played an important role in English history at this time. James II was defeated in Ireland. Um, and this essay appeared in a magazine or like a newspaper. It was not published in a book. It was not handed out on the street. It was published in like a, a periodical. It was written for English nobles, but it was written also for the agreement of everyday English people. And it could do that because literacy rates were rising, and there was a public sphere. Uh, Swift was technically from an upper class. He's not a lower class person. So like, look at all of these key ideas in the 18th century that this essay uh, exemplifies. Uh, that's why I had to choose this essay. Also, I think uh, there was also some discussion of numbers and statistics. Uh, yeah, I No, OK, in an older version of this handout, I also wrote utilitarianism, but uh, not in this one. So, OK. Uh, right, so. Do you have questions about this essay? Uh, I mentioned previously that Ireland was England's first colony, Zimingdi. This is what I mean. OK, so for next week, uh, let me show you the schedule because it's kind of crazy. Uh, so last time I introduced the romantic period, next week we're going to read the first thing from that period. Hang on. Here, next week we're going to read some poems from William Blake. Uh, it says that the following week, I will introduce the Victorian era and the midterm exam. I think that's a little bit too much. So next week, after reading and talking about William Blake, I will introduce Wordsworth and the Victorian era. But the Victorian era will not be part of the midterm exam. It will be the first unit after the midterm exam. So, right. uh, so next week I will pass out a new handout for the second half of the semester. OK, so now we should talk about William Blake. Blake, 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 Blake. William Blake is a really cool guy. 
he is often considered a mystic. He's one of those people that if you meet on the street, you might think he's kind of crazy. But then when you listen to him talk, the more you listen, the more interesting he becomes. Uh, he created his, in his literature, he created his own group of gods uh, as a kind of mythology, 个人神话. Uh, and another interesting thing about him is that he's not just a poet, he's also an artist. He made woodcut engravings in color. Let me show you. Uh, so this will be. How do I? Ah. This will be one of the poems that we are going to read. When he published it, he did not publish it in a magazine. He combined the, the words with the pictures and he published it as a book. Uh, using his own money. It did not make money for him. It was just something he liked to do. So like each poem is, can be is beautifully illustrated uh, and the pictures add to the meaning and the feeling of the poetry. Now. The handout. Is in black and white. And I have to save space, so I was not able to give you the images. But if you're interested in this, you can go online and do exactly I just, uh, the same thing I did. Type Blake, the title of the poem, and then choose image search. And you can find the illustration for each poem. Right, so Blake's representative work is called The Songs of Innocence and Experience. Innocence here means uh, the lack of experience, naive, Tianzhen uh, Wuxie. It's a collection of short poems, and one half is called Songs of Innocence, one half is called Songs of Experience. They're each half, uh, how do I say this? The names of the poems of each half are very similar. So if you look at your handout, in the Songs of Innocence part, you have the chimney sweeper, the divine image, Holy Thursday, nurse's song, and infant joy. In the Songs of Experience, you have Holy Thursday, the chimney sweeper, Nurse's Song, The Human Abstract, and Infant Sorrow. So the titles of these poems are very similar. They are supposed to be related to each other. It's like the two poems are about the same thing from two different perspectives. The first one, what is what does this look like if you don't know much about the world? If you are an innocent young child listening to a bedtime story. The other song of experience, what does this actually look like in the real world? How do people actually feel about this? So if you put each pair of poems together and you think about it, you'll realize that this book, Songs of Innocence and Experience, is about the Industrial Revolution. It's about the experience of working people in this time of history that is terrible for working people. Um, and once you realize that this is the main idea, then even the poems in the first half can feel a little dark, a little negative, a little pessimistic. Big one. And yet they're illustrated with such beautiful colors and pictures. And that's really what makes Blake's 
poetry so interesting. So we're not going to read his poetry about mythology and gods. We're going to read his poetry about the Industrial Revolution. As you just saw, it's 10 very short poems. And because he's writing about the experience of working people, he's also writing for working people. So his language is very simple. Um, he's, he's writing in the style of like fairy tales and like songs for children. So I think it, these should be the easiest poems to understand in the first half of the semester. And then the following week, we're going to read something harder. Questions? OK, we have a little more time, so let's uh, begin reading the first one. The Chimney Sweeper. When my mother died, I was very young. OK, so the speaker is probably the chimney sweeper. A chimney is if you have a fireplace and it burns fire, the smoke comes up through the chimney on top of the house. Yen uh, Song. And, you know, over time, the chimney will become dirty because you're burning, right? There will be ash, there will be dust and smoke. So over time, you need to clean the chimney. You need to sweep the chimney. So the chimney sweeper uh, in Chinese would be and so this is the person who's talking. When my mother died, I was very young and my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So he must have, or yeah, it's he. He must have been very poor because his father sold him. And his age at that time was still very small because he could only say weep. Weep uh, is a pun, Shuang Guan Yu. On the one hand, it means to cry. On the other hand, you'll notice this. right? It's a it's an apostrophe. It's omitting a letter. Uh, at the bottom, the footnote says, the child's lisping attempt at the chimney sweeper's streetcar, sweep, sweep. So how do you find a chimney sweeper? They walk around on the street yelling out sweep, sweep as a kind of advertisement, as a commercial. So it's a pun. On the one hand, he's so young that he's still crying. On the other hand, he already has to work as a chimney sweeper. So your chimneys I sweep, and in soot I sleep. Soot is the dust from a fire. I know it says oh, oh, but the sound is uh, soot. So this chimney sweeper is not a man. He's a boy. He's a very young boy. And it makes sense because chimneys are small. A, a grown man cannot fit into a chimney. It has to be somebody small. Uh, did you guys see that movie about a train? I can't remember the title, for God's sake. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Um, so line five, there's little Tom uh, there. There's little Tom Dacker who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So now the speaker is talking about somebody else. Another little kid, Tom Dacker, when his head that curled like a lamb's back. So his hair used to be very curly and full like a lamb. But his head was shaved. Why? Why would a young kid with such great hair need to shave it? Because it has lice. Poor kid uh, doesn't have time, energy, or knowledge about personal hygiene. So he's crawling around chimneys all day. He's going to catch lice. Uh, and if you have too much lice in your hair, 
at that time the the there was not like the chemicals used to kill lice today were too harmful back then so the fastest and cheapest way to get rid of lice is to cut off all of your hair so little tom dacker had lice he had to get his head shaved and he was crying right he cried so i said hush tom shh be cool never mind it byungguan for when your head's bare you know that the soot cannot spoil your white hair if you don't have hair if you don't have your head of white hair, you don't have to worry about getting it dirty when you sweep the chimney. OK, another question. Why is his hair white? Little kid, why does he have white hair? Maybe malnutrition. But like, think about this logic. The dude had lice. He had a beautiful white hair that got cut off. And the way that the speaker comforts him is by saying, don't worry, now you can do your job better as a chimney sweeper. And so he was quiet. And that very night, as Tom was asleeping, he had such a sight, that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, Ned, and Jack, were all of them locked up in coffins of black, guan cai. And by came an angel who had a bright key, and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain, Cao Ren, leaping, Tiao Ri, laughing, they run, and wash in a river, and shine in the sun. Then naked and white, all their bags left behind, they rise upon clouds and sport in the wind. Sport means to have fun. And the angel told Tom if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. Want means lack, trefa. And so Tom awoke, Xing Lai Le, and we rose in the dark. Rose is to get up from bed, to wake up from bed. In the dark, right? So before sunrise. And got with our bags and our brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. How does this poem make you feel? I don't know about you, but it doesn't make me feel very happy. Uh, so you can read the other nine poems. Please read the other nine poems before class next week.